Hello, my name is Victoria and today I will be going over Chapter 1. Cells as a Unit of Disease from the Pathologic Basis of Disease 10th Edition Book by Robbins and Cotran. These videos are meant to be short and by section. My goal for these videos is to be informational and to help you view the content from a simplified point of view. With that, let's get started. What is pathology? Pathology is a study of suffering or the study of disease. It is derived from the Greek word pathos, meaning suffering, and logos, meaning to study. The first section that we will be covering is the genome. This is located in page 1, chapter 1 of your book. Before we dive into the nitty-gritty, we need to understand the human genome. The human genome is made of approximately 3.2 billion DNA base pairs. Out of all these base pairs, 98.5% do not encode for proteins. In simpler terms, they just don't make any proteins. These genes that do not encode proteins do have a function though. They are involved in gene regulation of the 1.5% of genomes that do not encode for protein. Therefore, as the name entails, they regulate or control those genomes that do. Okay. So there's this YouTube channel called Study This, and I love how they describe the human genome, and I highly recommend checking out their videos. So the quote states, every cell has very similar genes to encode various proteins, but it's how well those genes are regulated that determines what that cell function is, which is expressed as a genomic blueprint. The first section we will be talking about are the five major classes of non-protein coding sequences. They are promoter and enhancer regions, binding sites for factors that organize and maintain higher order, non-coding regulatory RNAs, mobile genetic elements, for example, transponsoons, otherwise known as your jumping genes, and last are the special structure regions of DNA. Okay, I'm not going to read the PowerPoint slide to you, but on the next slide, I'm going to simplify what all of this means in a super, I think, fun and easy way. In the meantime, feel free to pause the video and take notes of this slide before I move on. Let's talk about how our DNA gets its instructions out to the rest of the cell. Imagine DNA as a big library full of books. Each book has instructions for making different things our body needs. But how do we know which book to read and when? That's where promoter and enhancer regions come into play. So think of promoter regions as the library's catalog system. These are special areas right at the start of the book or gene. They tell the librarians, which represent our transcription factors and RNA polymerase, hey, start reading here. So like how the librarian goes and helps you find the book, that's what they're helping the DNA do. This is the process of copying the gene into mRNA begins. Now, enhanced regions are like motivational posters in the library that say, read more books. These can be far from the actual book or gene they control. When transcription factors and other proteins bind to these enhanced regions, they boost the reading activity, making sure more copies of that gene are made. So in summary, promoter regions kickstart the reading process of a gene, while enhanced regions boost the reading process, making sure the gene is read more often and more efficiently. And that's how our cells know when and how much of a gene to read. Here's the helpful tip to help you recall. So, promoter and enhancer regions are DNA sequences that bind transcription factors. Promoters initiate gene transcription, while enhancers can be located far from the gene and boost its transcription. And the second class is binding sites for factors that organize and maintain higher order. So this one's pretty straightforward and to the point. They are areas which help change the chromatin structure. If you don't remember what chromatin is, they are the structure larger than DNA. So going up the organizational chain, you have your DNA, and then one step higher would be your chromatin. Normally, when we think about genes, we imagine them being turned into proteins, but some genes have different jobs. These genes are transcribed, meaning their DNA is copied into RNA, but they don't go on to produce proteins. Instead, they have a unique role. These special RNA molecules directly regulate other RNAs that will eventually turn into proteins through a process called translation. Think of them like managers overseeing the production process. Believe it or not, these non-protein-coating genes make up about 60% of our genome. 
That's a pretty big chunk. So here are two examples. We have microRNA. These tiny RNA molecules play a big role in regulating gene expression by binding to other RNA molecules. Then you have long non-coding RNA. These longer RNA molecules are involved in various regulatory functions, influencing how genes are expressed. In summary, while most of our genes go on to produce proteins, these special RNAs focus on regulating the processes, ensuring everything runs smoothly. They are crucial managers in the cell line's production. Non-coding regulatory RNAs do not produce proteins. Instead, they manage all the other mRNAs that are going to turn into a protein. Mobile genetic elements, or for example, transposons, these genes are known as jumping genes because they have the ability to move around the genome during evolution. It's like they can jump from one place to another in our DNA. More than one third of the human genome consists of these jumping genes. In these specific regions of our DNA, genetic elements are found in very closely related species, such as chimpanzees, but they're located in different areas. It's like having the same book, but with chapters in different places. Special structural regions of DNA. Think of telomeres as protective caps at the end of our DNA. Just like the aglet, the plastic tip at the end of the shoelace that keeps them from fraying, telomeres protect our DNA from damage. Centromeres are like the glue that holds our DNA together. They are the attachment points on DNA that help during cell division specifically mitosis. Centromeres contain satellite DNA, which contains certain repeating sequences. These are important for spindle apparatus attachment during mitotic cell division for the separation of DNA. Lastly, centromeres help maintain heterochromatin, which is a tightly packed form of DNA. This packing is important for regulating gene expression and maintaining the structure of our chromosomes. The picture above is figure 1.1, and you can find this on page 2 of your book. Looking at the picture, I need you to remember that enhancer and promoter regions of the DNA is going to tell the specific segment of DNA to get turned into this messenger RNA. But before that happens, the mRNA has to have influence from the non-coding regulatory RNAs. So keeping the special structural regions of DNA in mind, you have your chromosome right here, and your telomeres and centromeres. So here is your heterochromatin. It's dense and inactive. Because heterochromatin is so dense, transcription cannot occur. And that is something that you need to keep in mind because when those promoter and enhancer regions tell the gene to be read, that's when finally the mRNA can be um, opened and translate, translation can occur. Now let's talk about genetic variation in the parts of our DNA that don't code for proteins. First, there's something called polymorphism. This is a fancy word for changes or variations that are in our DNA. These changes can sometimes play a role in causing diseases. Humans are 99.5% genetically identical. That means the difference between each of us are only about 0.5% of our DNA but that small percentage accounts for about 15 million base pairs in our differences between one another. Now, there are two types of major types of DNA variation that we will dive into later. The first one being single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. These are small changes in a single nucleotide, which is like changing one letter in a word. The second one is copy number variations, or CNVs. These involve larger sections of DNA being repeated or deleted, kind of like copying and pasting whole paragraphs. We will explore these types in more detail, but for now, just remember that even small variations in our DNA can make a big difference in who we are and how our bodies function. The first type of DNA variation, SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, are a single base change in a DNA sequence. Think of it like a typo in a very long book where one letter is changed. These SNPs are variant at a single nucleotide's position. For me, I like to think of it like in the Loki series. Where Loki has different variants of himself, our DNA can have different variants at specific positions. Most of the time, these variations are bioleic, meaning they come in two different forms. It's like changing one specific base pair in the DNA sequence. For example, imagine the base pair AT or adenine and thymine 
changes to CG, cytosine and guanine. So SNPs are tiny changes in our DNA, but they can have a big impact on how our genes work and how we function. Again, just like how Loki's variants have different characteristics, these DNA variants can lead to different traits in us. Continuing with our discussion on SNPs, these little variants can occur across the entire genome. They pop up in exons, introns, intergenic regions, and even coding regions. Interestingly, only about 1% of SNPs occur in the coding region of our DNA. And this aligns with the fact that only about 1.5% of our genome is dedicated to coding for proteins. Most of these SNPs are what we call neutral variants. Again, just like how some of Loki's variants might not have a significant impact on the multiverse, these SNPs have no effect on gene function or phenotype. They just exist without causing any notable changes. However, these neutral variants can still be quite useful. They can act as important biomarkers indicating whether a disease associated polymorphism might be nearby. So how do they do this? Imagine a neutral SNP is physically close to a disease associated variation. Because of their proximity, they might be co-inherited. So even though the neutral SNP itself doesn't cause any issues, it can serve as a signpost that there's something important happening nearby or like a Loki variant causing chaos in a different timeline. SNPs in non-coding areas might seem inconsequential, but they can significantly affect gene regulatory elements. This, in turn, can alter how genes are expressed, which influences the way our bodies function. For example, consider a gene that normally codes for a vital enzyme. If an SNP occurs in a regulatory region associated with this gene, it could change the gene's expression pattern. This might mean turning off the gene when it should be active, leading to a lack of essential enzyme production and potentially causing disease. Furthermore, SNPs can be in linkage disequilibrium with other genetic variations. This means they are often inherited together because they are close to each other on the chromosome. As a result, the presence of an SNP can signal the likelihood of nearby genetic factors that also contribute to disease traits. This interconnectedness highlights the importance of understanding why SNPs in non-coding regions they're not just passive parts of our genome, but active players in our genetic health. Lastly, copy number variations, or CNVs, are our second example. CNVs represent significant stretches of DNA that can vary greatly between individuals. Unlike SNPs, which involve smaller changes, these are not just tiny edits, but involve large segments of DNA. About 50% of CNVs affect gene coding sequences. This substantial involvement in the coding area is a major driver behind the diverse traits we see in humans, contributing to our unique phenotypes. CNVs can manifest in several forms that might be familiar from your biology classes. So we have deletions, duplications, and inversions. Deletions are where sections of DNA are completely lost. Duplications are where sections of DNA are copied and repeated Inversions are where sections of DNA are reversed within the chromosome. Remember, unlike the mutations we often discuss that affect small DNA segments, these changes occur over large stretches of DNA, making their impact potentially more significant. To illustrate the scale between any two individuals, there can be variations ranging from 5 million to 24 million base pairs due to CNVs. As we discuss these variations, I've included an image in your materials that visually explain deletion, duplications, and inversions to help you better understand how they occur and their effect on our genome. So this large-scale genetic variation is a key factor in what makes each of us unique, influencing not just our physical traits, but also how we respond to environmental factors like diseases and medications. With this, this is the end of Section 1, the human genome we cover only pages 1 through 3. The next video will be over histone organization. See you then!